Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Earned Income Tax Credit Brigade Workshop. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, it looks like I see a lot of people who are from a small number of brigades. So I think I, I'm, we might skip intros of everyone this time. And what I will recommend for everyone to do while you're uh, listening to our team introduce ourselves is to go to your screen at the top and use the three dot menu to change your name to include like a parenthesis that puts your brigade affiliation in there. Like I just changed mine to say like CFA at the top. I might put open Oklahoma in there too. Um, if you go to the gallery mode or if you hover over your video, wherever your your video is. Oh, yeah. find your own. Do you just want first names? Um, and just rename and just put a little parenthesis after your name to indicate where you're, which brigade you're from, so that if people can start to. Cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you all for that. Um, so we have quite a few people here, so that's, that's excellent. Um, I'd love, and we're in a uh, conference room at Code for America, so I'd love to go around um, the room here and introduce my teammates who are working on the Earned Income Tax Credit uh, project. So we'll start with Kelly. Sure. Hey guys, I'm Kelly McBride. I'm a product manager here at Code for America working on the Earned Income Tax Credit team. Hey. Hi everyone, my name is Anu Murthy. I am a senior product designer on the EITC project. Hi, I'm also on the EITC project and I'm a software engineer. What's yeah. your name? Oh, I'm Jenny, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm gonna learn about a name tag too. Jenny's computer is restarting right now. It was updating, so sorry. She doesn't have her own Zoom yet. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Ben Boulder. Uh, I'm the lead engineer on the project and also um, worked closely with some of the other teammates here on the early research um, to, to um, identify this project. Hi, I'm Annalise Graham. I'm a senior program manager here. I work on the Get Fresh team and the UTC team and was part of the uh, folks that transitioned from workforce to EITC originally. Awesome. And I'm Tom. I'm a software engineer on the network team, and I'm working with the Earned Income Tax Credit team uh, as part of this project. Cool. Excellent. So what we have in store for you today is uh, Kelly will be talking quite a bit uh, about the, some history of the project and what has led us up to this point right now. Um, so first off, why are we focusing on this? This is something you, know, uh, you might not have affiliated with Code for America before. Uh, so a little bit of background on that. Um, we'll introduce the VITA program that stands for Volunteer Income Tax Assistant Program. Uh, then we'll transition into what we're doing for tax season 2020, which is already upon us. Uh, and then we'll talk about how you can get involved. Like, why are we here in this information session tonight? And then we'll leave some time for questions and discussion afterwards. So um, feel free to put those in chat um, as we go so that we don't forget about them. Um, and just come up with things that kind of pique your interest as, as we're going. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly to go through the first three of these items. Cool. So I'm going to talk at you guys for a little bit just to give you some background on the project, and then we want to spend the bulk of time really talking through the project with you guys. And where we're going to start is with workforce research. Um, so as you mentioned, some people in the team here um, started out just looking uh, at how we can improve the way government helps people find and, and keep living wage jobs. Um, so this was really thinking through like, what are some ways that Code for America could help um, solve this problem? And what we led, uh, what we found out through the research is really that training and certain like uh, later downstream things are not necessarily what people need to uh, living wage, to get a living wage job. It's really about raising floors and building ladders. So what we mean by that is making sure that people have a stable foundation um, to actually access jobs and keep jobs. And um, a lot of the barriers are around working conditions and actually feeling like you can progress in your career. Um, so that is a really simplified version of a lot of it, hard work that went into um, workforce research, but it led us to realize that people actually need flexible cash in order to um, keep and uh, keep living wage jobs. Um, so this is an example of someone we talked to in Colorado, um, Naja, and she was saying that you know she got a job, but 
due to lack of cash, she actually couldn't get to her first day. Um, or she got to her first day and used her last um, amount of cash. Um, and I'm sure you guys have seen the statistic a lot that four in 10 adults have trouble coming up with $400 if there were to be an emergency. And this just speaks to um, if you don't have flexible cash, it would be really hard to keep a living wage job um, if some unexpected emergency would cause you to not be able to put gas into your car to get to your job. So we really found that cash was the need um, in order to help people succeed in the workforce. Um, and through that exploration, we found that there's actually already a really effective cash support out there called the Earned Income Tax Credit. Um, in 2017, the Earned Income Tax Credit delivered $65 billion to 27 million households. That makes it um, very close to SNAP in uh, or EITC in combination with SNAP as two of the most anti effective anti-poverty um, uh, mechanisms out there. So we talked to some people who uh, weren't claiming the EITC, and we'll talk a little bit about the gap later. The EITC is actually claimed through a tax refund, so you have to file your taxes in order to claim the EITC. And we talked to a couple people um, and told them about the uh, credit through our research uh, as we shifted research to the Earned Income Tax Credit. Um, and we're able to get people really big refunds. We found that this is a huge cash support and um, it really could help people do things like grow their business, as we saw here. Um, and we found that although the ERC is super effective at um, lifting people out of poverty, it has a really large participation gap. Um, you can see here, we've done some estimations around uh, what is left on the table. And if we estimate around $1,300 per, um, per refund, um, we think that there could be around $10 billion that are not claimed. Um, that could be claimed, and we wanted to know why. So we did a little bit more research as to why is there this huge estimated gap when we know that it's so um, effective. And this is just comparing EITC to SNAP. They're two really effective programs, um, but the gap is actually double what SNAP's gap is. So. You might, there might be a few people that don't know what SNAP is. You might want to just mention. Ah, SNAP is um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. That's um, formerly known as food stamps. Here in California, it's CalFresh. So those are food aid versus um, cash benefits. Um, so this is just a picture of what um, a single parent living on $10,000 a year with one child would get. The earned income tax credit um, definitely increases. Uh, it's it's aimed, increases as you add dependents. So it's really aimed at working families. Um, so you can see here a picture of the benefits someone might receive if they are a single parent um, with a low income. So they'd, they'd receive almost $4,000 $4, in SNAP, which is grocery benefits. Um, you can see that they could receive more than that uh, just by filing their taxes and receiving the appropriate credits. Uh, a huge portion of that is their income tax credit. Um, so we did some research from there, seeing there's a really big gap. Why are people not claiming this benefit if it's so effective at lifting people out of poverty? Um, and we had a lot of research insights that I'm going to run through really quickly. Um, but one thing we found is that people aren't filing because they don't think they have to file their taxes and aren't necessarily aware that filing their taxes will lead to such a big credit. Um, so it's sort of an awareness issue. We also found that people don't file because of an emotional hardship that may have interrupted their life. So if you can think through filing your own taxes and how many things about your personal life that you have to bring up in taxes, um, a lot of people just found that as bringing up past trauma. Um, also, the hardship itself could make it hard to file your taxes. Um, and so we found that there was just a lot of barriers in terms of uh, life circumstance that prevented people from filing their taxes um, and claiming the ATC. We also found that their taxes are confusing. There are all these ambiguous and often negative consequences of filing. People are really afraid of getting audited and doing their taxes incorrectly. So if they make under a certain amount and don't need to file, they rather than file and claim a really big refund are worried about the negative consequences they've heard of um, floating around. Um, and then it's hard to find trustworthy, affordable help. A lot of people um, either pay someone to do their taxes when they don't need to. Someone might be um, providing tax support, but it's like taking a percentage of their refund. So we found that it was hard to find trustworthy, affordable help uh, when free help should be available. 
Um, and then the other thing is that help that is available out there, which we'll talk in a little bit about programs that offer um, help for tax filing, isn't necessarily available where they are and when they need it. Um, and so people weren't accessing the help they needed. Um, so through our research, we kind of distilled this into one sentence we've been using a lot, that people need tax help that is trustworthy, free, clarifying, thorough, and accessible. So what that means is um, trustworthy, so it's, it's someone they can work with um, in order to help clarify a lot of those um, confusing pieces. Um, also, it's, it's not a scam, essentially. It's not going to take a piece of your refund. Um, free in that it needs to be affordable and um, help is, free tax help is entitled to low-income individuals. Low-income individuals are entitled to free tax help. Um, clarifying, as we mentioned, a lot of people just have a couple questions um, and need to clarify their situation and aren't sure how that translates into taxes. Um, thorough, so it needs to make sure it covers um, all the situations that one might um, encounter. And then accessible, so it needs to be something they can actually access. Um, and then we also have learned from other research projects that awareness alone is insufficient. So just letting people know that they that this cash support is out there um, doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to go start filing their taxes. A lot of other referral experiments um, have found that just telling people doesn't mean they're going to go file. It's really about helping reduce the barrier of filing taxes rather than just increasing awareness. I might just add that there's a Cal Policy Lab who does uh, randomized controlled trials around policies in California, recently released like one of the most thorough examinations of how effective outreach is for helping people claim the EIGC. Um, they did it in California and their results were basically that out was, was very much supporting this, that just outreach alone did not make a significant difference. Uh, and yeah, concluded that they need to we need to simplify the process of tax filing to get people to claim. Awesome. Um, so that led us to VITA. We knew that there was this great cash support that people are not claiming. They needed a way to, con to actually claim um, their, their refund that's entitled to them through that thorough, trustworthy support. Um, and that led us to the VITA program. Um, so VITA stands for Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. It's actually an IRS initiative. Um, IRS, the IRS works with CBOs who will then... Are CBOs? Uh, uh, Community-based organizations. <laughs> so they work with community-based organizations. So for example, um, United Way, Goodwill Industries were actually set up, a lot of them are actually in combination with workforce centers. Um, so those partners will set up, um, will set up VITA centers, which are physical locations where someone could go work with an IRS uh, certified volunteer to actually get their taxes prepared for them. So that IRS certified volunteer has gone through um, a couple different things on the IRS side. They have certified um, sort of that they are trustworthy and that they abide by the roles and responsibilities of the IRS, but they also get certified in helping people do their taxes. Um, so they go through a training program that we'll talk about a little bit later that actually helps them um, learn how to work with people to file their taxes. And then VITA has a really high accuracy rate. There's 93% accuracy rate, uh, which is way higher than um, a lot of the traditional like online preparers. That's actually out of date. It was last year, 98. Ooh, all right. So, Close so that higher. three into an eight. <laughs> um, so even more, access, or even more accurate. Um, and that is due to a lot of things. Part of it is because through this VITA process, every uh, return gets a quality review by a second volunteer. Um, so people are really checking for um, accuracy rate. And they also handle audits. So there's like this trustworthy piece. They're working one-on-one -on -one with individuals to build trust and make sure that they're not gonna get penalized for filing their taxes. Um, and that's kind of why we brought, VITA is sort of why we brought this to you guys. Um, I think there are a lot of overlaps in terms of the services VITA and the brigades provide. VITA directly works with people to help prepare taxes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what the process actually looks like in a minute. Um, and the brigades are super knowledgeable about human-centered design, but both brigades and VITA are sort of distributed networks across the country. So um, there are VITA organizations in, I think, all states, um, and they help uh, community access government benefits, both of you guys. So um, what we want to explore today is sort of we, we see the gap, we have some solution ideas, but we want to see how we can help um, sort of harness the people power of the brigades and work together to actually deliver, um, deliver this service and close the gap. Um, 
So we want to do a pilot with Vida um, to help deliver that $10 billion in flexible cash to people who need it the most. Um, and we think this is, will be done through scaling Vida because they're already providing that trustworthy, accessible, free clarifying service. We just need to sort of work on that accessible piece. So this is what um, Vida prep looks like currently. A uh, client would gather all their tax documents at home and they would bring the tax documents to a Vida in-person clinic. So they would find one that's close to them, look up the hours, head over to the clinic, um, and then sit down with someone to sort of discuss their tax situation. There's a paper form they'd fill out that answers things about their income, their expenses, their household. Um, and then on site, the Vida volunteer would prepare the return, have it reviewed internally, and then they'd review it with the client so that they could um, file the tax return. Um, so it's all um, in person. A lot of people will actually go in person and wait in line. Um, they might wait while someone actually does their taxes for them. Um, there are other models where they might drop off their documents and come back later. But the traditional Vida model is you actually go in person and have someone prepare your taxes for you. Um, but if we're going to close the gap, we need to make that process more accessible, especially to people who either can't go at the time that Vida is open, they don't have a Vida site near them, um, or other reasons that might prevent someone from actually going to get that in-person trustworthy support. Um, we think that in order to close that gap, uh, Vita's already doing 3.5 million returns, so it's a really big program and really effective and accurate. Um, but in order to close the gap of, um, or to reach those in the participation gap, Vita's going to need to reach more people and be more efficient. Um, so how are we going to do that? We think that by providing Vida with tools to handle clients more efficiently, so internal tools, and then also building an accessible digital intake process um, to get more people to Vida will help scale Vida and reach people in the earned income tax credit participation gap. That's what we want to test this tax season. So um, a couple things that we're hoping to pilot, and I think there are ways where the brigades can plug into each of these. Um, is one working on just a national website for Vida where you could go and search for a location near you. Right now there's a old um, IRS not super mobile friendly site where you can search for a location if you do want to go in person and if you have one near you. Um, then we want to work on uh, fully digital Vida tools. So um, you'll see that up here in these images. It's um, allowing someone to discover Vida online, doing that entire intake process, um, on their mobile phone and answering all of the questions that a Vida volunteer might need to know to uh, prepare their taxes um, on their mobile phone or on their computer whenever they want. Um, there's still going to be an in-person, or sorry, not an in-person, there will still be an intake interview on the phone where there will be a discussion between a Vida volunteer or an intake specialist um, and the person who's in the taxpayer. That sort of speaks to the clarifying and the trustworthy piece to really make sure that um, the Vida team has what they need to prepare the taxes and that the taxpayer feels like they um, are in trustworthy hands. Vida will remotely prep the return. They'll still do the internal quality review and then they'll have a phone review with the um, taxpayer on the phone. And once the taxpayer consents, they will e-file and get their refund. Uh, but if we bring more people in through this funnel, we need to make sure that Vida can be efficient and sort of queuing up people. So we're also um, supporting them with efficiency tools um, in order to uh, make sure that we can distribute people who come in digitally to the right Vita sites um, and then also so that those Vita sites who are working on this pilot um, can actually uh, track where people are in the process and provide updates to clients through the process. Um, and this tax season we're working with four partners. Um, we're working with a partner in the Bay Area, United Way Bay Area. Um, we're working with Tax Help Colorado a Vita provider uh, based in Denver. We are working with the United Way um, of Tucson and Southern Arizona. And then we're also working with Goodwill Industries of the Southern Rivers, which will be preparing returns for um, Georgia and Alabama. Um, so all of them will be sort of using different portions of this. And we think if we can do that, that we will provide free and trustworthy, clarifying, thorough, and accessible services that will help reach people in the gap. And I think we'll also um, provide services that will really help us learn a lot about barriers people face um, to claiming the EITC and to filing their taxes. And we want to scale Vida. That will help people put gas in their car, help them get to their WIC appointment, pay off court fines, invest in job training that will ultimately help them find and keep living wage jobs um, with the flexible cash support that EITC brings.
So I know I just talked to you for a lot, a long time, uh, but that's sort of the background of how we pivoted from workforce to EITC and what we want to try out this tax season. And now we want to talk a little bit about how we think you guys can get involved and uh, where we could use your support. All right, so I'm going to take over for this part. Um, actually, can we go back yep. to the slide? I'm going to call an audible here and ask for any questions that people have about the, yes, the sort of code for America <laughs> part, the like EITC, VITA, like anything that was in the in the beginning part, just to, to make sure that we all understand. Any questions? No one put any interest. Or things you missed when the audio cut out for you briefly and you want to make sure. <laughs> I saw some chats popping up. Yeah. It's like, is this confusing? Is this... Happy to answer any questions in the background. Anyone? Okay. I hear something, but I didn't I didn't hear a full Take a get it. sentence. Okay. All right, uh, well, well, let's continue through this part then, and uh, we can answer any questions at the end in part of the discussion. So, the next slide here. So, uh, how can brigades get involved? So, uh, with a little bit of um, with a little bit of hedging, that this is very early, and this and we haven't thought of everything. This is definitely these are some ways that we came up with that might be good ways for brigades to get involved. But what we were really hoping to do is get everybody together here and talk about it and up with some more ideas. So um, here are some of the ways that we think uh, brigades can get involved with this work. And um, the first, and it's kind of a prerequisite for a lot of other things, is to get VITA certified. Um, I know that there are a couple people on the call, um, myself included, that have been VITA certified and have done this volunteering in years past. Um, so I'm curious um, for um, people to share that experience uh, if that's something that um, they're able to do. But uh, essentially what it looks like to get VITA certified. So first off, you should find your local VITA site, your, uh, the organization, the CBO that hosts, that like organizes it. Um, you can use vitataxhelp.org, uh, shameless plug for our own <laughs> product there, uh, to find your closest VITA site. Uh, and you can also look, there's a link to that IRSgov um, website. Um, we'll send out these slides right after we're done here um, so that you can get all these links and stuff. And just get a feel for what your local setup is. Um, and then you can go through the online VITA studying, like the, the curriculum. Uh, it took me about six or eight hours, somewhere in the range of six to eight hours. I'm not sure how accurate that is for everyone else. I think your mileage may definitely vary on how long it takes to get VITA certified. Um, it depends on how how much you paid attention when you do your taxes every year, I think. Uh, and uh, taxes are really hard. So like, that's just something to acknowledge in all of this work. Like that's really why, you know, that this work is so important and why, you know, just telling people that they should do their taxes doesn't work because they're just really hard. And getting VITA certified will enable you to directly help people with their taxes. So um, that's kind of like the first, uh, that's the, the first set of things that, that we came up with. Um, another, uh, another idea is coming up with VITA adjacent projects. So these are, you know, these are things where um, you might be able to complement the existing uh, landscape of free tax prep advice. So for instance, what barriers do people face in collecting the EITC in your community? Um, this is something like anecdotally, you know, every VITA organization is different um, and some are better than others um, in terms of like, getting out there into the community and being able to um, service them. So, um, so identifying sort of that, like getting connected with them um, and how and providing technology support to, uh, to improve the service delivery experience of getting connected with volunteers and uh, the VITA volunteers. If I can add just a little bit of color to that. So one of the things that is a challenge that we are aware of is that all of these VITA sites have slightly different setups and we're trying to build technology that can be used in a wide variety of settings. So the more we can learn earlier about how varied the sites are, the better we'll be able to create solutions that will work for everyone. So those journey maps of what your local VITA site will, is doing can feed into our larger process of building something that will really be effective. Definitely. And then finally, getting involved with vitataxhelp.org. So that's the product that we're working on on staff here. Um, and 
a couple ways that that might look. Um, so first off, like the most important is the last one here is to stay connected um, because I think we'll be, we're, we're gonna have to work together as a, as a group here in a way that we really haven't tried before with brigade members and, and staff working on this project. Um, so join that Slack channel, CFA Vita folks, we might rename that. Um, we'll, see what, we'll see what that is, but that'll be kind of the Slack channel for us to coordinate around this work. It'll have Vita in the name for sure. Uh, so search for that, join that channel. Um, and so what it might look like going back to the top of the slide, uh, vitataxhelp.org, um, there will be an opportunity for direct volunteer service. Uh, well, we think there will be. Uh, so that is that will be directly providing guidance to clients um, and collecting user feedback as clients go through vitataxhelp.org. Um, we still have to like figure out exactly like a lot of things for that. So that's not something that there's like a sign-up sheet yet for. But uh, you know, keep an eye on that, which is why it's important to stay connected. And then another thing is this is uh, inherently a sensitive. Uh, you know, a sensitive thing that we're asking people, to, our users to do, right, is to upload everything about their financial life to a website. Uh, so uh, we think trust is going to play a key role in, uh, in making this a successful effort. And so um, identifying blockers to trust and ways that we can overcome them. Uh, one example, a kind of shameless example, um, because of, uh, you know, Open Oakland uh, is close to my heart. And uh, one thing that we've done for the last few months, for the last year or so, is to set up a table at the public library and help people navigate the Quimai record tool. Um, and I think just being there in person really um, makes it a lot, like changes the dynamic of, you know, you're no longer just uploading all your stuff to your website, you're actually being reassured by the person there. So that could be like one, that's like one potential topic, uh, thought there. But um, that, that's pretty much what we got here. Um, I'd love to, turn it over to the discussion part now. Um, and maybe uh, let's start with, um, so yeah, let's do the discussion. Um, feel free to, um, feel free to uh, turn your, your cameras on if possible. And maybe Kelly, if you could stop screen sharing, sure. I think we can get that gallery mode going so everyone will be able to see each other. Um, there we go, look at that. There's a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, feel free to turn your cameras on. Um, we'd love to see everybody's face here um, and just, uh, let's go around. Or like, let's go around and talk about if anyone has experience with this before. Is if anyone was a Vita volunteer and wants to like share their experience. Um, if anyone has done any projects in this space before, like the, either the cash support process or uh, or like getting at, you know giving people access to cash supports or anything like this, or have just oh, like at all. And please, uh, as when you say hi, introduce yourself, your name, and your brigade. Uh, hello, my name's. Joey, I'm with Code for San Jose. Uh, I would like to hear about people's experience for uh, becoming a certified Vita volunteer. Yeah. Does any do any other Vita volunteers want to talk about that? Tariq? Wait, I'm sorry. I was reading a Slack message. What was the question? What was What was your experience becoming a Vita volunteer? Oh, did it help with my own taxes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling through that right now. Um, my experience, it was, it was probably something that I really like to do, um, probably because tax can be a little bit intimidating or complex. Um, so bit. my background, um, I studied accounting in college. Um, and so I really just kind of like to help people. And so going through this program, um, doing the training, um, and what we did was kind of similar. We were set up in a computer lab um, so that each volunteer could have, you know, laptop and whatnot and we'd have the volunteers come in and wait um, and then we work with them to do it but it's really fun because something that may be actually pretty simple for us or you know not as intimidating um, can mean a lot for somebody else um, like the presentation said there are different credits and you know things like that that people just don't know about that it's leaving a lot of money on the table that could go in their pocket um, so do know that if you choose to help with uh, being a vital volunteer um, you're really making a difference for a lot of people so I, well, really I was wondering more about um, if you don't like doing taxes. Oh, like, oh, I if thought you're, you're not that kind that. of person. Oh, I'm no. sorry. Oh, so, so you're saying I don't like doing taxes, but I would be interested in becoming a volunteer to help someone else. Like, yeah. I would get better at my taxes for one, but then I can help other people in the process. 
Oh, so yeah. So how is the process for someone who doesn't like taxes at all? Uh, <laughs> I, honestly, for me, I, when I did it, I think the hardest part, if you don't really like taxes or if you're not really familiar with the most of it, is actually passing the initial certification, if oh. you <laughs> But um, I'm, that's just my experience. But then once you actually start doing it, um, it's not really that difficult. You just need to make sure that you, that, you know, whoever you're helping has all of their forms. Um, some cases I had in the past were a little bit more complex and I referred them to someone who had a little bit more tenure than me, but other than I, I think it's not. Some of us here are studying for Vita right now so yeah. no, and are not accountants. So yeah, <laughs> and I, I hate taxes. I really despise doing them. Um, and I'm pretty lazy when it comes to paperwork, which is maybe part of why I'm an engineer. But uh, <laughs> I, I agree with that. Uh, for me, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going through it right now, so I'm not done with it, um, but, uh, and I don't have any, any accounting background or much tax experience background, and I'm finding it pretty straightforward, like, basically, the, you know, you, they, they give you this big reference material binder, or it's like a PDF, you can get it online, it's essentially the reference guide that you would do for, that all volunteers use throughout the whole process of volunteering, um, mm -hmm. everything at the IRS has a number, it's called the 4012. Um, and, uh, you basically look through the 4012 and then, um, there's a practice test that you can go through that sets up these cases and asks you some sort of tricky questions with multiple choice answers. Um, and you basically just look things up. It's all open book, both the practice and the official test. When you go online, there's, there's an official IRS test to go through. Um, so for both of them, it's open book. You can look anything up that you need to. You can look at the reference materials, um, but the questions are tricky enough that you you do have to like know enough to, to know what to look for uh, and know how to search things. Um, I think it, 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 if it helps if you have an openness to, you know, getting a little into technical details because that's what it is. Um, if you, there's some tolerance for kind of surprising or confusing roles. I think for me, I just mm -hmm. like, I'm okay with, I've been doing engineering for a while. So for me, that's part of engineering too, which is weird. Yeah, it's stuck over a little going through that right there. <laughs> I think other people. Yeah. Um, and I think it depends on your Vita site, but I, I think that sometimes, especially if volunteers are just starting out, they can work together on, on cases. Um, so you're not. Oh. Yeah. I'll also add to that, to what you were saying is that like, I also get like dread doing my taxes, mostly because I just don't understand it. So I think there is a lot of value I've been getting from our training sessions just like to understand it and like now I will soon have a very good life skill that I can hopefully share with other people. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing about kind of timing is that time is of the essence here because tax season is about to start in earnest in early February, I think. Like most people will have the forms they need in the beginning of February. So Vita sites will probably be staffing up around right now actually. So this is probably something you want to like think about or you know, share with your brigades to try to get as many members as possible interested in this within the next couple of weeks because uh, it's something you don't necessarily need to pass the test immediately, but it's something you need to like think about and actually like actively research pretty quickly because uh, yeah, tax season is soon. Um, I'll just add a little bit about my particular experience. So there's, um, so you know, we, the, I, I phrased the, the slide in a way that was mentioning just becoming Vita certified so like that's that's just passing the test that Ben referred to. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean like that you have to also like volunteer with a site. Um, I believe like you probably have to take the test in accordance with a site, or, like in conjunction with a site. But then you kind of negotiate your like level of commitment with that site, and um, there's all kinds of levels like um, the 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 my site that I went to last year and then I'm gonna go back to this year had three days a week of doing it. It was Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, and Saturday was like eight hours. But I just kind of told them, I'm like, I'll do it once a week, I'll do it Monday nights. And so that was kind of my level of commitment. Um, and so I'll probably change that up a little bit this year, but that's kind of a thing that you figure out if you wanna you know, engage with the local Vita site. I also want to be clear that although it is incredibly helpful to have the VITA certification, we are hoping to be able to create roles for folks who don't have that full certification. So mm -hmm. if you're interested, even if you know you won't be able to commit to doing the full certification, you should still join the Slack channel and stay involved. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, just to like echo that, um, put a finer point on it, <laughs> whatever the, uh, that, 
that we know that that like this is like the highest like that's a work that's a lot of time commitment so like that's maybe for the accountants that are like really or like that's for people that are like interested very interested in this effort and uh and looking to learn another skill to help people get literally thousands of dollars back um that doesn't need to be everybody um so yeah we'll, we'll be looking for different roles and sort of to the original question of like there's other ways to get involved and help people find and get access to this program other than directly doing it. Right on this topic, there's a question in chat from Thomas. Can you just read it? Thomas, do you want to read it? Yeah, sure. Hey everyone, uh, this is Thomas Decker from Open Oakland. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if, uh, if, if brigade, could brigades contribute user research for any of the tools in development, um, either the front door or the full digital access or the efficiency tools? Yes, I think that's the short answer. Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Great. I think our, our, in terms of timing, our plans for digital intake are probably going to be around February, mid February. Um, so we would have user research for like the end to end product then. Um, the website is live now um, for the location search. And then the internal tools are, that, those are required by the certification. But yeah, definitely the digital intake. Um, or just like learning about pieces of the process too, if it's not fully end to end, uh, learning about how someone might like get their documents or, um, yeah. Uh, just to clarify the, um, the digital intake, uh, you mentioned f like mid February of having a, a launch product at that point or? Yep. Do you have, okay. Yeah, just to clarify, so we have that one website up, vitataxhelp.org. It's already up with searching for existing vital locations. And when the digital intake comes on, it will be tied into that website so that people will be able to either search for in-person stuff um, near them or go through the online intake. Um, you might also mention the online intake has a limited capacity because it's a new thing that we're piloting. So we may turn that off at a certain point if, we, if our partners are getting home overwhelmed uh, with new people. Um, so it's, it's something we're testing out. Um, yeah. I think doing some basic usability testing, so sort of combining that idea of um, how do we build trust? So maybe if you have a community-based organization that you know and love and they have a set of clients they're typically working with and you could potentially set up a little station and do um, the digital intake with folks there and let us know how the intake form works. So sort of simultaneously supporting people to get through the service and um, also let us know where people are getting stuck. That would be incredibly helpful. There's a question here. All the centers from MB, uh, all the centers have the same required documents and information, right? Um, I think that's roughly true. Uh, basically, there's a standardized intake uh, sheet, actually, that the IRS requires for all VITA sites. Um, and uh, there's some variance, which is like VITA sites are all volunteer run. So some sites are actually like mostly high school students. And some sites are a bunch of accountants and tax lawyers. So they might have differing levels of ability. And so some sites may actually say like, oh, I can't help you here at the site because we don't have people who can handle that kind of situation. Um, but in general, they do uh, ask for the same required docs and information. And it's the stuff you might expect. So like W-2s. 1099s, that kind of earnings information forms, as well as um, they have a standardized intake sheet. The documents you, you provide are also, there's like the standard ones, and then there are additional documents that you need to provide based on your tax situation. So if you have um, dividends from like an account accruing interest, like there's a separate form for that. And part of what our intake um, process will do is help ask the right questions. So we have a sense of what tax documents someone might need to bring. So you guys are probably starting to get documents in the mail from various, um, from the IRS, but from various like activities you have in terms of income and expenses. So there's standard docs and then there are all these like other IRS docs that someone might need to bring. Kristen, Kristen has in the chat there. Kristen, do you wanna say the thing that you put in chat? You wanna talk about that? Oh, I was kind of piggybacking on what Thomas said in, in uh, getting user feedback, user testing in some way. Uh, my assumption is that if we're working with pilot groups, those are the ones that we can partner with if we're going to watch what they're doing, find out what they're different. Uh, they're, you said there is so many differences between them. That sounds mm -hmm. like 
problem to tackle. If we solve it for one location and 50 others can't use it. Um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but I think like part of this is, you know, we are to some degree, we're, we're working to standardize it with our partners, but um, where we feel like it matters the most to make sure it's standardized, but um, we can only, we can't be there in person to see how everything's going for them all the time. So um, even just having folks that are in touch with them and involved and can like help you relay to elevate things, mm -hmm. especially more folks that are user research or technically minded that can bring things up, I think is really helpful because a lot of our partners don't have that background. Um, I think that's that, that would be helpful. Um, I think the difference is that I'm trying to the dip, I don't know how much the difference is. We really honestly don't know if the differences will greatly impact like their the ability to deliver the service at all. I think so far it seems like it'll be fine, and we've talked through what some of the differences are. But um, they just yeah, I think like we're introducing a bit more of a standardized process to them. We don't know what we don't know. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and we're getting to know our direct partners fairly well, but there are also so many other writing sites out there that we hope to be able to partner with in the next tax season that knowing their process to know would be really helpful. Um, and I think we would have to figure out exactly how to coordinate it to do outreach to some of those sites, but I don't think we necessarily need to limit the site research to the current partners that we have today. Yep. Should we talk about long-term opportunities? Would that be relevant? Uh, just that we're expanding, we expect to expand more. One, while they're thinking about that, one other thing that I want to mention is part of making sure that this goes well overall is making sure that our tax prep partners who are going to be, frankly, in probably a pretty stressful time with lots of people coming in the door. Generally, they're pretty overwhelmed with the number of people who need services. Um, so figuring out how to have brigade members potentially play a role in some of those early days of making sure that the site goes smoothly and everybody is um, able to use the tools could be incredibly helpful just to sort of have a point of connection and make sure those sites feel supported through a potentially pretty big transition for them. It's almost like having friendly faces with our partners would be really helpful. Yeah, I think building on that, we um, a lot of Vita sites have the concept of a greeter. So someone who's just kind of at the door, like helping orient people, making sure they have their documents, know where to go. And um, so we'll definitely be looking for support in terms of like helping people at sites, um, go like walk them through, like I mentioned at a table, walking them through the process. Um, we also in the future, will probably be looking for support on like intake interviews and um, helping get people through the digital process that will require the VITA certification. Um, but it's definitely something that we know we're going to, if we can get the people that we want to in the service, we know we're going to have a potential bottleneck there. Um, and so the more people that can do interviews or at least help answer basic questions before they get to the interview and help people move through the process, um, we think is really going to help the service succeed. Just want to pause for a second and Take another question. I know someone's got a question. We got a question from Kristen. Another uh, journey now. Uh, oh yeah, do you want to say it, Kristen? Yeah, I don't know if it's if it's the, the path or the track that you guys are trying to concentrate on, but for me, I'm all about process, and I'm curious about how how you're going to do this. If there's a plan mapped out, you know, a Gantt chart or whatever, just even the steps that you plan to do and, and uh, for me one of the first things is you mentioned a journey map so I'm curious if that's already been created and or are we needing to feed that and create it so that we can share it with each other. Yeah. Um, we have done journey maps in the past for both the existing VITA process. Um, there's a couple existing ones um, so we've done some of those in the past and um, happy to I guess we could dig up, I can't get it right now, but I could sort of look and dig up some of those images if they're interesting. Uh, we also are, of course, building out this new flow. So we, uh, Anu has been uh, leading the charge, sort of building out what this like, online flow is. Um, that being said, I think journey apps are always a great way to just like audit how things are actually working. Even if you have a picture from a design and implementation standpoint, what you think it is, that doesn't mean that's what it is. Uh, you know, it's different for anybody going through it from different angles. So I think that's always valuable, um, but we do have some. 
Um, and uh, I, I would say that kind of work is still quite useful, um, just getting another perspective on what that journey is like. Kelly and I were chatting about this a little bit of how helpful it would be if we could create sort of a very high level journey map that has what we know are the required steps. And then we're like, somehow the client gets from mm -hmm. this part of the step to the next part and a lot of different types do it in different ways and basically have sort of a template that we can hand out, have folks fill in um, what's happening on the ground in different places. Um, awesome. Um, I know I noticed Michelle raised her hand earlier um, and I thought that we answered it, but uh, why oh, don't this you- This is a uh, different one. Different question. All right, go for it. Yeah. Um, have you found, have you looked for any commonalities in the journey maps? Um, yeah, yeah, we did, we definitely have, um, so, uh, I guess I can't, I don't have them in front of us right now, but I guess, um, yeah, and that's part of what led us to what we're doing right now. Um, so obviously there, we're sort of building new services, that's sort of the new journey map, but, um, it hasn't really been tested that much. Um, but I would say that the, uh, for the existing Vita services, uh, some of the commonalities we saw um, was that uh, on the user side, um, we saw regardless of what type of Vita thing it was, um, folks had a lot of trouble like arriving with everything ready. So basically, um, if you were a client, uh, you have to show up to the site with everything. Uh, if you show up and you don't have everything you need, you'll typically get turned away. Um, and uh, we didn't, Vita doesn't currently track uh, sort of the breakdown of, of who arrives to their sites, including those who get turned away. We heard anecdotally that the vast majority are returning clients, which would make sense if when you come as a new client, you're likely to just get, you may get turned away if you're not totally used to the service. Um, so they're, they're not attracting a lot of new folks. Um, and I think a lot of people fall off at that stage, which is not currently, uh, yeah, uh, track right now. Um, and then uh, we also uh, know that um, you can actually find out that you're not eligible for Vita services. So there are eligibility requirements. Um, and is, there is sort of a, uh, let's say a long tail of weird edge cases. Um, the reason that eligibility exists is because IRS provides a specific training program. And if certain cases are outside of that training program, they don't really want Vita trying to do those things. Um, and so uh, basically there's sort of these weird edge cases that can pop up while someone's taxes are being prepared and they can find out while they're pretty deep into the process that they are not eligible for FIDA. Um, and uh, they, they, that, um, that's, that's one thing, it's not often, but it does happen. Um, and uh, what are some of the other things? Um, I think just like common use cases too, like often we'll see, um, groups that, you know, people who are self-employed have a very different experience than people who are current students or have student loans. So I think like thinking through, there are certain things that the IRS requires every VITA volunteer to do. So there's sort of a common like skeleton of the structure, but then from the user perspective, I think there's a couple different permutations and or infinite number of permutations of how you might interact with someone at VITA. And the experience is probably quite different depending on your actual like life situation, which impacts your tax situation. So that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, I had a question from Alan. Are you a little unmuted? Are you unmuted? Mm, yeah. Um, you said that you were working in the Bay Area. I guess this is for Bay Area brigades with um, like United Way and Goodwill. Was that goodwill in the Bay Area, or and is there opera, is there a way for us to channel brigade volunteers to those organizations? Mm -hmm. In the Bay Area, we're working with United Way Bay Area. Um, we could probably send out like direct links to their services, but they work in San Francisco, Oakland, I think the North Bay and South Bay as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so they have a bunch of sites. If you go to our um, if our website, you can put in the Bay Area. Um, Bay Area zip code and everything in the Bay Area is delivered by United Way. Um, mm -hmm. The Goodwill um, partners are in Georgia and Alabama. Um, so I believe they're based in Columbus, Georgia. Um, and then we also have a partner in Tucson, Arizona that serves um, Tucson and Southern Arizona areas. Um, and then we're also working with Tax Help Colorado, which is based in Denver, but has sites um, across Colorado. So do you have, um, recommendations if <laughs> you mentioned that they might need non-technical help like readers or mm -hmm. that kind of thing um 
So do you have ways of kind of channeling those kind of volunteers? Mm -hmm. uh, a good yeah, question. Yeah, um, not yeah. So I should say um, I, I don't really have a great idea of what the what those organizations could most use from uh, brigades because ideally that would be kind of how we you know how we approach them and, and offer help, right? So and I think I'll probably get a better understanding of that in the next week or two. And um, I don't know if um, if any teammates here have a better idea for exactly like what the sort of what we could go to those organizations right now with. I think there's definitely something there. Uh, some, there's some value prop that, that we would have to engage with those orgs. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a little bit of partnerships work that we need to figure out on our end before we, before we set that up. But uh, there will be, I think we should do some like follow-up calls for that kind of thing. Yeah, I would say if you're interested in doing either a sort of light touch it could even potentially be just like one or two times volunteering at a site or if you're interested in doing the deeper vita certification you should join that slack channel and let us know what you're interested in and where you are um and then we can try to do some matchmaking on our end i think like our conversation with the folks in georgia for example um they were imagining that they always have people who come and don't have all of their documents for example or they come and they get in line they realize that they're actually not going to be served because there are too many people online and the site's kind of close mm -hmm. before they get to them. So how could we catch those folks and not have them just be turned away, but have them um, brought into the digital tool and then we can continue to serve them over time? Um, and I think that that's the kind of thing that you could do with a very little mm -hmm. amount of training. Um, so we should just stay in touch. They may, I guess, they may require FIDA certification at some level for even kind of uh, reading roles. So typically that would be like at least like a code of conduct training at a minimum um, in order to volunteer at their sites. I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. Uh, I see Brendan uh, wrote one out here. Are you able to read it, Brendan? Um. Uh, I guess, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. yep sorry. Yeah, uh, I was just curious um, if 211 um, locations might be a place that could recommend the site. Um, we know our 211 starts recommending tax information around this time. Um, and then the other question I had is we only have AARP and Anchorage uh, sites, and they require your social security card number. Um, and I was just curious. Which I don't know where mine is. It's somewhere in a box somewhere. Uh, is that required for VITA sites? Yes, the IRS uh, requires VITA sites to uh, like confirm people's social security numbers um, for as part of just identity verification for tax filing. Um, it's also often required of tax preparers as well, though they don't always tax preparers, private preparers, don't always ask to see your social security card. Um, but yeah, that's actually a requirement the IRS imposes on VITA sites. So, that, so they have to bring their card with them, like the blue paper card? Correct. Yeah, as I understand it, the vast majority of VITA sites will expect uh, the person coming in to bring a social security card for every person who's listed on the tax return, including their dependents. And that's uh, using the in-person services. We are providing a way to, for the digital service um, through an identity provider to actually verify your social security number without having the physical card. Um, but if you are using an in-person site, you do need to still bring it. Uh, and is that an option for, I mean, is that a possible thing for brigades helping people get their SSN? Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is our, our schedules for our ARP are like third Wednesday open for two hours location. The schedules aren't uh, really that mobile friendly. And I wasn't sure, uh, since we don't have one, when we look at your VITA site, I can't tell. It looks like you guys list times really well. But is that an opportunity for brigades to provide uh, an easier way to, for people to know VITA schedules or when they're open or a Twitter bot or just like, where can I go get taxes done today? I'm just um, blue sky IDing here. Okay. Those sound like great projects. Yeah, I think that would be helpful stuff to work on for sure. I think there's a lot, frankly, that VITA could use help with. <laughs> yeah. 
there's just a, they, they're a limited, you know, it's delivered by nonprofits and volunteers, um, like a lot of brigades. Uh, so it's it's they could they could use uh, help serving people better, but they do have a direct impact. Um, they do a great job of serving people. Um, yeah. And the, and then sorry, the last thing, like uh, playing off someone else's question, just having your laptop there at a Vita site that's full and uh, having some kind of credential, but just getting people to just start the process on your laptop uh, for the digital intake. Um, and that's something you're thinking around mid-February would, would be a possibility. Yeah. Digital intake for yeah. yeah. And in that case, we'd, we'd coordinate with the actual site. Um, but yeah, that's definitely. And some of our sites actually have workforce centers where they have computer labs. So in Georgia, they have actually a, a room that people could go to and you don't even need to bring your computer um, to support. You could actually just have people using the computer lab there and um, walking them through the process or walking around answering questions. Cool. Awesome. Um, I see Alan asked about social media content. Well, um, as you know, as time comes by, we'll definitely come up with some uh, some collateral for you you all to use to uh, get the word out um, as well. But I definitely would invite anyone who uh, has an idea on that to collaborate with us in the Vita channel there. Um, and with that, I think, so we're at, we're after five uh, or eight or somewhere in the middle. And uh, I want to thank everyone for showing up tonight and being interested in something that's, you know, kind of, kind of nerdy a little bit, maybe, you know, a bit wonky. What's nerdy? Well, we're going to all get money. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to get cash to the people. Get gonna, cash to the people. Yeah. Get, give people a thousand bucks that uh, can go right back into our local Economies, right? I heard a stat recently, which is that it may be about a million dollars a mile in a lot of the communities. A million dollars a mile per square mile. Per square mile. Um, wow. Yeah. It's, a, it's really a lot of money that is brought into communities through the ITC. So it's a great way to help your local economy. Awesome. So thank you all for spending the evening here and join that Slack channel. We'll get an email thread going and uh, stay tuned for more information about how to engage with us. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.